This podcast is sponsored by the Music Player Network at musicplayer.com, the premier musician resource for keyboard players and beyond. Since the year 2000, the Music Player Network has been the go-to source for news and views on music technology, playing tips, and gigging help. The Keyboard Corner is one of the longest-running keyboard forums in Internet history, with guitar, bass, drum, and numerous recording and music tech forums also on offer. Frequented by weekend warriors, manufacturers' representatives, and professionals alike, MPN provides an invaluable resource for any musician, and it's 100% free to sign up and use. Go to www.musicplayer.com to see for yourself. Hello and welcome to episode 29 of the Keyboard Chronicles, a podcast for keyboard players of the gigging variety. I'm your host, David Holloway. Always brilliant to be here with you. And once again, I have the excellent co-host Paul Bindig here with me. How are you hanging, Paul? I'm hanging great. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> and it's a pleasure to be here once again, doing what I love to do, chatting to you and keyboard players. And I think the how's it hanging thing's, you know, appropriate given we've got a, an Australian guest on. Um, yeah, true. And- so, yeah, this episode sees us talking to Glenn Reiter, keyboard player and saxophonist. So, Glenn has been seen over recent years touring with iconic Australian acts Icehouse and John Stevens uh, of Noiseworks in Excess and Solo fame. Um, so, we talked to Glenn about a range of topics, including the particular fun in touring the big brown land that is Australia. Hope you enjoy it. Glenn, thank you for joining us, and particularly thanks for joining us on a Sunday morning. That takes true dedication. Oh, you're welcome. I think uh, right now, Saturdays, Sundays, Wednesdays, they're all pretty much the same. (laughs) That is very true. Uh, It's like I paid you to segue to my first question, which was every guest we ask how they're coping in these challenging times. And, And obviously in Australia, we're very, very lucky compared to a lot of countries, but We've still had a lot of um, limitations on gigging and touring and so on. So, how have you been keeping busy? Uh, well, uh, through a lot of that lockdown, I've got two uh, boys who are thirteen and ten. So they and uh, mum's still very busy working from home. Like she kept her job and had a very busy year, but from home. So I became a, a teacher basically um, for most of the year and. Um, I did find out that uh, having kids at home during lockdown is a complete productivity killer. Yes. <laughs> yeah, there wasn't there wasn't there wasn't a lot else to achieve. I've been writing I've uh, been writing a bit, uh, um, sort of writing prospect, sort of prospective songs for with some of the other boys in the band for John Stevens, and um, we'll see what comes of that yet. Great. And uh, so that's been good. I've been kind of trying to get. Get across a bit of new gear, some new plugins, and things like that. And um, but yeah, like I say, kids, kids have yeah, taken up are. a lot. They're a huge um, productivity yeah. killer. There's, there's, there's tip number one as a working musician: no kids. No kids is probably a pretty good, um, you know, career advancer. But uh, you might end up being a bit lonely as well at the same time. So that's uh, right. I don't know what I would have done if I hadn't got married and ended up with kids. So could have things could have gone very pear shaped. Anyway, Gwen, are your kids into music? Are they? Are they? Yeah. Um, music? Yeah. Um, thanks for asking. Um, uh, my oldest son Hugo, he's thirteen, and um, he's really getting into guitar, and it's just um, everything Nirvana and Silverchair at the moment. Hey, cool. And, yeah, and uh, next week he's doing a holiday camp thing called uh, Rock Academy. I don't know if you guys have heard of that. Oh, we get, we're actually going to even ask you about that. So, yeah. um, oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so that's um, uh, Alan Long and Phil Sobrano's baby. And uh, they do it at a, a fantastic studio down here, a rehearsal facility down here called Bakehouse in Richmond. And, uh, yeah, I've been involved in that as a mentor you know, uh, I haven't done all of them. I've, they just bring me in every now and then to, um, you know, sometimes run the whole show or just be the, one of the people on the ground there. 
And uh, it's basically, you know, anything from like 20 to 40 kids between, say, 9 and 18 wow. um, coming together to, you know, and they get formed into little uh, bands and they do an original song and a cover in four days. They, so they'll write a song together and they'll learn a cover together and then they'll perform it all at the end of the week. And uh, it's absolutely amazing. It's, that is. Yeah, it's shown me a lot about um, that kids that are really into music, they're a bit different. Um, yeah. So you would think, for instance, like, you know, and maybe I just had really low expectations, which is really unfair on the young people there, but um, you would think with a whole bunch of teenagers that there might be a little bit of, like, you know, testosterone stuff going yeah. on or, you know, um, maybe, like, you know, getting a bit too interested in the girls and, you know, all that sort of thing. And it's not, there's been none of that. And it's always just really respectful. The kids are really supportive of each other. There's a huge range of abilities, but nobody's ever made to feel like, you know, they're no good. Um, it's really like a restore your faith in human nature. Yeah, actually. So anyway, Mike, he's doing his first one uh, next week. That's excellent. Now we will definitely yeah, get into my, that. I mean, you, you could, you could argue that, just everyone getting on and, and all the stuff that's not happening is saying is pretty much proves the death of rock. But um, I, I think that is a good outcome. Oh, absolutely. And they go on to form their own bands and several of them have gone on to, you know, have stuff on Triple J Unearthed and, you know, they're right. out there doing their own gigs and, you know, making their own little mini EPs and things like that. And for so those, those outside Australia, um, and this may cause contention to our listeners in Australia, you can pretty much argue that Melbourne is the home of well, both music, but particularly rock in Australia. Is that that fair comment, Paul? I'm sure you agree, Glenn. Glenn but... yeah, yeah, I think it is a fair comment. And a disclaimer, neither David nor I are from Melbourne. So no, uh, that's right. Is it, but, but yeah, I, I would say that's a pretty fair assessment. Yeah, it's a great live music scene and, and art scene in Melbourne generally. Yeah. I, I think some there's some other cities too that like kind of, you know, not to be condescending, but they punch above their weight. So like the number of bands that have come out of Perth and Adelaide is quite mm. astounding. And Brisbane, you know. That's so true. uh yeah, you know, and Newcastle. Newcastle's almost like our Seattle, isn't it? Yeah, like, true. <laughs> yeah. So so um uh yeah, but I agree. I think like um perhaps in a way, not having an RSL club sort of scene in Melbourne put people more into pubs and things like that as live music venues and yeah. and not into an RSL kind of clubs environment, which is much more conservative and much more sort of safe and kind of, you know, sticking with the, you know, the, the, the cover band sort of thing yeah, and stuff like right. that. So I think a lot of musicians maybe if they were in Sydney, might have got diverted more into that rather than kind of into a, you know, for want of a better word, a more creative sort of scene or something. That's you know? right. Yeah, the good old RSL. And again, for our um, non-Australian listeners, Returned Services League clubs are clubs set up for veterans and um, usually had great stages and great large auditoriums, but, yeah, very conservative and not the place you'd necessarily want to go to watch a good rock gig. Uh, all right, so let's talk a bit about you, Glenn, as far as your history. Um, so, you know, kick back to what got you into music in the first place when, you know, you're a little bit younger than you are now and um, what led up to you becoming a, a professional muso? Uh, well, uh, all as kids, we all, me and my sisters, we all had to learn an instrument. It was sort of part of what my parents considered a rounded education, I guess, you know. And my dad, I did piano, and my dad was a, a bank manager and mostly in like country towns. You know, mm. we'd move around from every three years, we'd move to another country town and start again. And um, when I was really getting into piano, that meant we'd have to get up at like 6.30 in the morning and he'd drive me to a farmhouse half an hour out of town. I'd have my piano lesson from seven till eight while he ate his breakfast in the car. And uh, wow. so it'd be like pitch, it'd be pitch darkness in winter and, um, and then he'd drop me at school. You know, and uh, so we did that for, God, probably three years, you know. Gee. So, yeah, so that was real uh, dedication on, on my dad's part there. And um, 
but uh, yeah, I just really enjoyed actually learning learning piano. And then I suppose like a lot of people, I kind of you know drifted away from it. You know, in my in my teen years. Yeah. And I and I you know, I just remember one night hearing Paul Desmond playing something on ABC Radio. You know, play probably with the Dave Brubeck band or something, yeah. and I just went. I want to learn how to play that. So from there, I was like, uh, I was about 14. So I had three years to learn to play saxophone. And, um, yeah, I just completely kind of buried myself in that. Mm. And when I was 17, I was the first saxophone player accepted into the um, Conservatorium of Music at Melbourne University. Oh, cool. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, um, and I did that for a couple of years, and then I realised this is only really setting me up to be a teacher, which wasn't, yeah. well, you know, nothing against anyone who's teaching. They're an amazing job, and I'm glad that they're doing it, but it just wasn't for me. So I went and did, like, some other just weird jobs. Like, I was making clotting agent for haemophiliacs at Commonwealth Serum Laboratories okay. for a year. I was a lab technician and then um, then went to uh, Victorian College of the Arts in the jazz stream. Oh, yeah. Um, and through all that time, I wasn't really playing much uh, keyboards. It was just, you know, really saxophone, saxophone, saxophone. Yeah, yeah. And um, then my first sort of touring gig was with a Blues Brothers Revival Band, which is actually based out of Tasmania. There you go. Uh, and so we'd, we'd play three, sort of three months at Hadley's Hotel there and then load up the vehicles and the bluesmobile and everything and, <laughs> and hit the road. And so that was my first experience of touring because, like, we do, like, we did crazy things. Like, we did, I mean, once we did a gig in Geelong and our next gig was in Cairns. So we just drove. <laughs> Not the next the, day. Uh, 48 hours later. You know, and you drove. So just drove. Yep. <laughs> We drove everywhere. We, we, I've been across the Nullarbor like three times. So again, yeah, we, that was another one. Yeah, we had a gig in. Uh, we had a gig in. I think it was Frankston or something. And then our next gig was in Kalgoorlie. <laughs> Whoa! So for yeah, again yeah. for a US or you, it's like that's the equivalent of driving, say, from if you're a US person from San Diego to north of New York in yes. forty-eight hours. Yeah, that yeah, to, to to go from one gig to the next. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so that was sort of. Um, I think, like, I'm actually quite. Um, I'm a bit of a road pig. I don't mind being on the road, yeah. you know. Um, and I think, like, that was my baptism of fire on that. Like, just really hard touring in very uncomfortable vehicles, no aircon, mm. you know, all that sort of stuff. Like, this is like, you know, early to mid '80s sort of time. And just, you know, all the things breaking down a lot and all that and do, sort of stuff. Do you stuff. think you would cope with it now, though, Glenn? So I won't drop a, a name here, but I, I'm aware of um, – I've got a mate that's a musician that just toured over uh, like the year before last in Europe with a well-known uh, band, and um, they had to do it. They, they were on a bit of a tight budget. Had to all pile in the van for two weeks and got stuck in a snowstorm for 24 hours or whatever, and he's essentially said since, I'm never, ever doing that again. Like, I'm now at that age. I just can't cope with that anymore. <laughs> Yeah, look, I can understand that. I think, like, if it was your first tour of Europe, you'd probably wouldn't mind so much. Yeah, you know, um, absolutely. Look, I look, I the the days of like, yeah, what sort of hotel you're staying in is like, well, I can count the dead flies on the windowsill, <laughs> and, and that that might give you some indication of the quality of your comms, you know. Like, but I've got mates even that like I I play within like you know touring bands now that like. When they're not doing that, they go off with their original band and they're driving the deadly human, you know. Yeah. They're, they're crashing at friends' houses and stuff like that. Like they, because there's no, there's an original band that That's they're right. just trying to, you know, and they're still doing it. Um, I don't know whether I could do that. It's, it's, it's probably just the time in vehicles sort of aspect of That's it that right. would be, really, yeah. Yeah. But I know, but I, yeah, like I say, I've got like, I mean, there's guys I know that have like, you know, that they're doing real like top top tier stuff, and they will still go and do that, and I don't know how they do it. Yeah, 
It's a dedication. So yeah, so you got your taste with the the Blues Brother band, so touring and and um, what what progressed for you uh, for well, you from there? Well, then because we were based down in Hobart, I met like quite a few of the local people down there, musicians and that scene down there, and it was like you know people like Tim Partridge, you know, legendary bass player, mm-hmm. but you know has since sadly passed, and but um and Bill Whitten, who's you know just like the most amazing sort of velvet voiced bluesy sort of guy down there guitarist guy lots of uh and anyway um so i came back did vca for a year and i got a call to go down and play do brass arrangements and play on a local guy's record down there and uh while i was there i went to the casino and just had a jam with the house band in the cabaret room and then they called me and said oh we want to add you into the band so I got down there and it was just like, I don't want to just play saxophone mm. in this band. I'll be, a lot of the time I won't be doing anything. So I can't remember what I got. I think I had a Mirage, an Sonic Mirage. Oh, yeah. I think early to be on the EPS, yeah. But, um, yeah, so I uh, that was with uh, – there's a legendary local guy down there, Phil McKercher, oh, yeah, a keyboard player. Bell, yeah. Yeah, so he was doing uh, – he was playing all the – actual you know, the proper keyboard parts but I, I was able to like just do all the strings and stuff like that and like um yeah so and that kind of basically set the rest of my career as a a, a guy that plays parts that um you know uh, program you know matches sounds mm-hmm. plays his parts and can you know give you a saxophone solo as required you know so that's sort of like set it for me. Um, and whenever I try to find someone to debt for me on a gig like that, they're, they're like hen's teeth. Those, that double is just not done. Yeah, for absolutely. So, yeah, so I think that's that's sort of set all the direction for it, you know. And so that's what, um, obviously that and then, it, you know, because of that highly specialised approach you had, the, I assume you just had the approaches from more and more acts got to know more and more people. Yep. And um, so w- when I got back, I did that for a year. And when I got back to Melbourne, some of the guys in Kate Sobrano's jazz outfit were also at VCA with me. And then so subsequently I ended up playing um, second keyboards. Uh, the legendary Paul Gray was um, the main keyboard player in that. Yeah, and, um, okay. Yeah, and but again, I could like add strings, you know, add other little parts and things that, um, you know, Paul couldn't cover because there was a lot of parts in those sort of that brave era sort of thing from Kate. Mm-hmm. So uh, and and then when I wasn't doing that, was playing, uh, you know, with, with uh, Russell Smith on trombone. We were the, the brass section. So um, so again, like you know, playing keyboard parts and you know. The saxophone being a, the a, the other part of the other yeah, string yeah. of the bow. So yes, yeah, so I did a few of those, and then um, so like ninety nine, nineteen ninety nine, and I was like, I didn't know how I was going to pay next month's rent. Pretty pretty familiar story to a lot of musicians. <laughs> I guess. And I got a phone call to um, audition for um, Little River Band. Wow. And uh, so I went and auditioned for that and got that gig. And so I was on tour for the next five years in America with that. It's the Stephen Housden's outfit with yeah, yeah. Wayne Nelson's lead. And yeah. Um, and uh, that was my first, probably, you know what I call like my first proper keyboard gig because yeah. obviously I was the only keyboard player and there was a lot of keyboard stuff mm. and everything. So, so yeah, and I think like I kind of went, okay, well, I kind of feel like I'm a keyboard player now because here we are, we're in Rockefeller Plaza doing the Today Show. That's right. You know? yeah. so, they had us down one end of Chicago up the other end of the plaza and we'd play a song in Chicago, play a song, we'd play a song, like, you know, so, okay, like, well, if I'm playing reminiscing, 
Um, then I'm probably yeah and, a real player. Yeah, and cool, cool change and all that sort of stuff. Then I'm probably a keyboard player now. Yeah, sure. <laughs> In fact, I think one of my first gigs with them was a biker festival in Daytona. And I can't remember why, but something went awry before the encore. One of the guys disappeared. He might have had a bit deli belly or something. And so there was like this sort of, the pause was just getting longer and longer and longer. You know, we're going to go back on stage for what? And eventually I just jumped out on stage and just did an improvised keyboard thing for like two minutes just to fill in time, you know, just to, just to have some kind of noise going and make sure that the bikers knew that we were coming back. You know? did, did that mollify the bikers appropriately, Glenn? Yeah, yeah, I think it, I, I think it, you know, I think it worked. I was, I thought that we were going to get, when I saw the crowd, I thought, well, these guys are going to kill us, you know. <laughs> like, um, American crowds are very different to Australian yeah. ones. They don't have like musical prejudices they're just um so you can play for the bikers and they'll like have their arm around their girlfriend you know swaying and going you know time for a cool change you know yeah, yeah. singing along with all the ballads and all that sort of stuff whereas in australia you're like oh, get off you know yeah, you're that's right off, you know all that yeah so anyway so i got to see all of america i'm doing that like been to Every state except Hawaii and Alaska was that bad. Yeah. So that was fantastic. And then during little tour breaks um, there, I would often stay and just hire a car and just go into the back roads of America looking for the stuff that you couldn't see from the interstate. Yeah. You know? What was I using then? I think I had my J- I had a, a JV80. Oh, yeah. Yeah, nice yep. little unit. Yeah. Yeah, and um, I had a Technics P50 piano. Oh, there you go. Which is still my favourite uh, for action and sound. Like, I've never really been a Roland stage piano guy, RD guy. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I've always loved Roland since, like, um, I just, I, I was, I always used Roland stuff up until pretty recently. Mm. Yeah, no, it's, and we're definitely going to talk quite a bit of rig stuff too um, in a little while as well. So no, that that's good. Um, and so LRB, I mean, and just you, you make an interesting comment too, just as an aside. We, we um, interviewed in the last few days um, previous guest Dan Walker from Heart, and he he talked about not believing he was truly a professional uh, musician until he was sitting on the David Letterman show. Um, playing so it's fascinating you've just talked about rockefeller plaza in the today show has been a bit of a yeah and and we did um we did bb kings in that same little trip to new york we did bb Mm -hmm. kings and i remember like the first morning walking down there and just walking down to because we're staying in times square so it wasn't far to walk down to the to the bb kings and they, it wasn't open, but they had a trestle table out the front with kind of um, postcard-sized things of all the bands coming up that you could grab and go. So, of course, I grabbed a handful mm-hmm. of the LRB one with my photo on it, you know, <laughs> like with yeah. BB King. That's you know funny. what I mean? Those sorts of things. So there was a really hilarious one where we, we'd played this festival the night before, and the next day they captured Saddam Hussein. <laughs> and... The front page of the local paper, I think we're in Des Moines, and the front page had a, a photo of me playing a sax solo. Like, I don't know why they chose that out of a whole LRB thing because it's not really what you think of when you yeah, think yeah. of LRB, but, but that's what they had, and a photo of Sudan. <laughs> and that was the front page. I hope, I hope that's framed that. somewhere. Yeah, yeah, I hope you kept that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it said, like, you know, we got him, you know, and... <laughs> And it was unclear who they were referring to. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, look, lots and lots of experiences like that. And you, you're right. After that, after LRB, uh, when I got back, I just sort of did cover bands and stuff like that. And so, um, a great we had a great residency at the Esplanade Hotel here mm. with a band called Nude Funk Orchestra. That like that that re- I think they were there for like 15 years or something. Wow. One day and. Um, 
so that was kind of a cool way to keep the keyboard chops sort of up, you know. And and then um, again did a little bit of Kate Sobrano again, and then um, and then got the call again to uh, do ISAS. It, it's I assume not an unusual chain of events because you know those iconic acts around Australia, they're right, we're a smaller country comparatively, that, yeah, you, once you're seen and visible, if someone needs a great player, you're going to stand out as an option pretty quickly. Yeah, I wouldn't call myself a great player, but um, I think if you need someone who can play some keys and some saxophone, like, that would be... Well, yeah. Kind um, of like somewhere, I'd be somewhere near the top of the list, you know? And just, I mean, this is very much an Australian only joke, but I mean, are you, is there a sax, a rock sax oftenness association in Australia where sort of you, Joe Camilleri, I don't know, James Valentine, you know, have meetings and formal minutes and agendas and stuff? There's not many. Uh, no, I always, always like running into Joe on a festival gig and, you know, I run into Wilbur quite a bit because he's oh, often the MC. Yeah. yeah. Stuff. yeah. Um, I, I, I used to always go see Wilbur play when I was like, you know, a jazz nerd and just a saxophone guy you know used to always go see Wilbur play he's absolutely incredible and Joe is like the stamina of that guy oh, is absolutely incredible. yeah um yeah love Joe yeah it's great so Glenn um joining joining Alice House was that an audition process how, how did that obviously you got the call but how did that yeah. unfold for you um it wasn't really an audition it was sort of on the recommendation of uh uh, Paul Gilday, who's the guitarist in Ice House and had been guitarist in LRB the first year that I was in it. So, um, and in the beginning, like Ice House was still, they only be put back together to, uh, because they, my first gig with them was being inducted into the ARIA Hall of Fame. That was, wow. that was the first show. Wow. No pressure. Um, yeah. <laughs> But um, it was the the sax saxophone wise. It was uh, it's a it's not a, a, a difficult no it's not a difficult gig if you if you understand you know look if you understand if you're not a jazz jazz nerd and you actually understand then the saxophone part I don't find you know that that's the sort of okay I'll just do that at that time. Um, the keyboards were all on track. Ah. So, yeah. So I, but I learned all the parts and I thought, because you, because you can't convincingly, you know, mime anything without knowing it anyway. And I thought, if I'm going to learn these, I may as well get the sounds together, you know. And then having done that, I spent the next, you know, year just badgering either, like, let me, let's put live keyboards in, let's put live keyboards in, you know. Yeah. And we gradually moved over to, like, you know, live keyboards and, and um, yeah, so, and then for a while I was the only keyboard player in the band and we'd still use a bit of track for things that you just literally could not do with two hands. Yes. Um, and... Then we eventually got Michael Painter um, from the Veronicas, mm. and he's, he also has his, had his own solo thing. Um, a really amazing uh, all-round musician that can play everything. Um, yep. And he's not as a, good a singer as you, Glenn, Glenn. He's not much of a singer. <laughs> not much of a singer. <laughs> and I will for our listeners again. I'll post a link in show notes. Yeah, he's, he's got an incredible voice. Yeah, got an incredible voice. And um, yeah, I look BVs wise. I I, I had to do. That was part of the LRB gig. A lot of BVs, well, so and that, I, yeah. like I had the I had the top line part for reminiscing. Wow! On that, okay. From that band and stuff like that. And then since then, I've I, I don't know it's because I was terrible at it, but I've never been asked again. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine that. Like if you pulled off LRB, mate, you must to be doing all yeah, right. If you're singing in LRB, I yeah. reckon you were probably yeah, well, fine. <laughs> we used to listen back to the desk tapes and. It, sounded like amazing you know yeah. like the, the blend in that band because we we're all on in ears so it's absolutely um there's nowhere to hide when you're on in-ear monitoring yeah 
it's surgical, you know. There's no kind of ambience or just getting off on the vibe. It's really, it's like being in this, every gig's like being in, in the studio, yeah. trying to nail it. So, yeah, so, but yeah, no, I don't, I don't get to do any, no one lets me sing backing vocals. I don't know why. <laughs> it's very rude, I would have said, very rude. <laughs> Hey, just just on the uh, with, with you and um, with you and Michael, the the split of duties in terms of keyboard playing. Oh, I'm kind of interested in how that that works. Yeah, so when I was the sole keyboard player, it was a really challenging and fun gig, like a real head down, bum up gig. Um, split lots of stuff split across two keyboards. Um, lots of little tricks that you'd have to do to be able to kind of, you know, trigger and sustain a part and and then leave that for two bars to go to the another part of the keyboard or, or the other of the two keyboards while, while that sample mm-hmm. kept, kept you going, you know. Like lots of little things that you had to do to kind of make it work. Um, and then when we split it into two, um, Michael had a lot to learn in a short period of time. So we gave him kind of the simpler, sort of easier to remember bits. And I kept most, I kept the, like a, a bigger share of it. Yep. Um, also because he's playing guitar mm. as well. Sure. So, um, but it did go from a really full on, but fun sort of gig to uh, um, probably a bit too too easy, you know. So yep. the challenge became to sort of just concentrate and not mm. kind of vague out, you know. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so a lot of the time it's one-handers, you know, and things like that now. Yep. yep. But there's still, um, there's still some songs that like, like Mr Big, for instance, when we do do that, Michael's got a busy clav, synth clav part that goes through the whole thing, and I've got everything else, and that's and it's typical of how I've had to set up for Ice House gigs where I'm holding a brass swell with my little finger, not in the key of the song but just assigned to a key so that I can use my thumb on three of the black keys sort of almost down the octave to play a synth stab. Yeah. Um, oh, and they're also not in the key of the song. And, yeah, I'm just like, I mean, I think in that there's probably about eight, eight or nine splits across the keyboard on that. And that's yeah, just right. on a 61 note. Keyboard because yeah. they awesome. I, I've I've kind of um just because I've been in in um you know Tarago's and later you know Kia carnivals and things like that. If it doesn't fit across the vehicle, yes, it's a complete uh-huh. yeah yeah, and it's a pain to get it, it you know from the vehicle to the stage, and it's a pain to get it in baggage and it, it you know. It's a plane at the airport getting it on a trolley. It's yeah. you know, everything. So, so yeah, so I suppose I've tried to make 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 all sorts of uh, inventive solution, you know, problem-solving ways of feeding stuff onto 61 keys. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. That's um, awesome. And that often means putting octaves on pianos and things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, because I I haven't got that room down at the bottom of the range to actually play octaves in the left hand or um yeah all sorts of things playing stuff not in the key of the song because I was about to say if you had to pitch shift things to fit them on your real estate and that sort of thing yeah yeah, yeah so if it, if the if it's a white keys song and I've got parts that are like okay well I've got nowhere else to put I'll just put them on the black keys yeah and 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 that just lives amongst the white key stuff um yeah. Um, stomping on a sustain pedal, not for sustain, but to, you know, mute the verse one part so I can play the verse two part, you know, things like that. Um, 
yeah, if that's yeah, it makes it hard for. I've just gone through because um because uh I've had to get uh, we've got somebody else doing the ice house. There's some ice house shows coming up in uh, hopefully like all all going well, sort of February March. Mm. Um, but they all clashed with John Stevens' dates, and John's been, you know, he's going to do a lot of work this year, and, and um, John's been very good to his band through the whole lockdown thing and stuff, supporting us. So, um, so I've just said, oh, look, I'm sorry, guys, I can't can't do this little run, and I've had to sort of teach all this stuff to yeah you know, another. They do a great job, you know. Um, also, like, you know, I've charted for the same reason. Like, you know, if you've got lots of – the worst thing about being a keyboard player is that it's – on a guitar, that note is that note, you know, uh, and it's that, it's that sound. That's and right. on a keyboard, it could be literally anything. And um, so I do yeah, do my own kind of shorthand charts for everything, like a cheat sheet yeah, sort of yeah. thing. Because if I come back to a song in three years, I'm not going to know where my splits were or that I was actually playing this bit in a different key to make it fit or some other weird thing that I've done. Or Yeah, so I do cheat sheets for everything and that all just lives, you know, in main stage and comes up on the screen if I need yeah. to refer to it. You know. I love, yeah, I love main as, stage. As you say, text, though, yeah. As you say, though, Glenn, for a depth coming in for you, be, because it's it's obviously stuff you've cooked up in your own mad scientist lab there. Um, for someone right. coming in, that's a real challenge to pick that up, isn't it? Even if your notes are quite good. Yeah, yeah, it is. And um, the 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 guy that is is uh, picking up that slack for me is just one of those guys that's just got almost photographic memory retention of stuff. Yeah. So, so he'll he'll be. He'll be fine, but yeah, I absolutely agree because, like, you know, you set things up you, yourself your way. You know, because you made it. Very hard mm. for somebody else to come in and learn that just as a purely mechanical thing. That's right. Yeah, no, great point. And I mean, you mentioned um, Glenn about you know going way back that, that it was more tracks in Ice House and, and before going back to live keyboards. I'm assuming that you've had feedback or or the band have had feedback since just what. Um, a force of nature you guys are live now so I mean I saw you guys a couple of years back and just the quality of the band but also the sound it's I, I saw you at the Enmore Theatre there and that's easily yeah. one of the best sounding gigs I've ever seen at the Enmore it's just yes. amazing I, I think we've been very um, very uh, fortunate to have an amazing front of house guy Richie Robinson um, who's the right guy for that band? He's a sort of a hi fi sort of guy, yeah. but hi fi, hi fi, but with energy. Yeah. So I think he does an amazing job. Um, what we do, and it's, we had one, we've had one occasion, I think we're in New Zealand, where the Pro Tools rig failed and we, because there's still other percussion parts oh, yeah. backing. Um, there's still keys on there, although Richie just, you know, on um, TV these days, like, you know, for, for like, you know, the mass Singer or The Voice or things like that, where they've got a live band, but they're also running tracks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what that gives you is a kind of a double fat sound. That's right. So that's what we do in Ice House now. We blend a bit of the track back in with the live keys, and it just gives you this wider, thicker sort of more complex mm. sort of sound. Um, and uh, we had a, a, an occasion where the Pro Tools re went down and we just, we played the whole gig live and it was actually, it was fantastic. It was great. But if we hadn't done, if if I hadn't pushed for the live keyboards and done all that work, we, I don't know what we would have done. No. Mm. no. So the live keyboards became the backup to the Pro yeah, Tools. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, that's cool. And we will talk a little bit more. You, you made a great point before about recreating older sounds. During your rig discussion, we'll, we'll sort of cover a little bit more on that. But just to jump to John Stevens for a minute, um, so you've mentioned you'll be doing a bit of work, everything going well um, this year. So how, how did that relationship come about and, and the differences in playing with John? I, I did some gigs with John probably about 12 years ago, 10 years ago. Um mm -hmm 
playing keys and sax with him. And then he was doing a lot of kind of cut down gigs mm. um, and didn't really use keyboard player for a few years there. And he's playing some pretty small venues and stuff. But um, John's career is sort of in the ascendancy again mm. at the moment. And um, so we are doing like, you know, the, the huge festivals, the, you know, we will do, there's no problem for us to fill a, a you know, 1200 capacity beer yeah, bar yeah. and stuff like that. So, um, and yeah, doing the, doing the kind of mid-sized theaters and of course doing all those red hot summers and, you know, by the seas and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. yeah um, Tony Featherston was playing keys for John. Okay. Um, he's a really, um, uh, he's, he, uh, is the keyboard player from the Bad Loves. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic keyboard player. Great. Guy. And, um, he'd been doing it and he, he was sort of ready to take a break because John, um, does a lot of time on the road and it's not yeah. for everyone. So, uh, yeah. So I joined what, 2018 okay. and we did like 130 shows that year. Wow. Okay. Yeah. We did 120 last year. Uh, well, no, we would have done 120 yeah. last year. <laughs> Um, yeah, and then uh, this year, I mean, was like we've got we had fifty shows in the calendar for between February and May. Yeah, wow. Uh, I don't know how many of them will happen yet. It's all about borders. And, That's right. You know, yeah. So we'll see. What we're doing, we'll definitely do my music bowl on on the twelfth. That's rock and the bowl. Yeah. That'll be my oh. second gig of the year. I, I, I played some sax with the DJ at some guy's birthday party last night and <laughs> rocking the bowl will be the second one. There so. you go. That's, yeah. <laughs> oh, look, this it's is a working one. musician. Yeah. <laughs> same, same. Yeah, same scene. Um, and John obviously is, uh, oh, I wouldn't say he's more rock than Ice House, but he's obviously more, uh, I don't know how you'd frame it, but he, I assume are you doing a lot more... Uh, less synth and more piano, organ sort of stuff with John. Um, well, of course, like it's 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 noise works. Mm, so there's a lot of synth in that. True, a lot yeah. of synth, a lot of lot yeah. some piano, a lot of pads. Yeah, um, and um, in excess, just so you know. Yeah, so he does do. I was going to ask that. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. John said at the moment is kind of like a noise works in excess collection. You know, um, and so it's. It, yeah, it's all thriller, no filler, and um, lots of iconic synth stuff. Mm. Um, so do you play Don't have... Change, Glenn? Do you play Don't yeah, Change? Yeah, yeah we do. Course. There you go. We do. Yeah, and um, uh, I've I've actually got to like hang out with Andrew Farris a bit because he's he's come on board for a couple of like yeah, you know, hey mates and things like that with us. And um, so I got got a chance to go through the in excess stuff with him and pick his brains oh, and so that's great. What what he helpful. remembers about it and stuff, yeah. So that's really helped. And he's got a bit yeah. of a memory for gear. We had the pleasure of having Andrew on the podcast, and he certainly I know he sent me through a massive list. He's, he know, he remembers his gear well. Yes, absolutely, and um, he remembers a lot of nuances and mm. stuff like like. Say, oh no, no, we didn't use the such and such on that. Yeah, just like you just make a little tweak to it. He goes, yeah, that's it. That's the sound. That's it. There you go. Because yeah. you know how it's. Well, I think one of the challenges for people doing my job, if you're you're um, um, just going from what you can hear from the album, and the keyboard's mixed back, and that's right. And and sounds change depending on what's around them. So sound could be quite bright, but that could be being masked by something else. Um, mm. Trying to, like, you know, you, a lot of the time you just love, oh, can I please just have the multi-track? Can you get, get me the stems for that? I really need to hear that on its own. I can't tell amongst all these guitars exactly what's happening there. Um, with Ice House, I've had some of the original 
you know when you got a got a profit, you got this um, printed sheets that you could like mark where all the knobs were for a sound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he still had a lot of those. So back then, I was using the Native Instruments Profit, yeah, yeah, Pro, the Pro, Pro Five um, plugin. So I just like replicate that in there, and that would get pretty close. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, then I've God, I've had to reprogram those sounds like three times now because then Native Instruments stopped. They must have not continued their license with sequential circuits to use it or something. Yeah, they stopped yeah it's profit. not part of their suite yeah. anymore. You're quite right. Not yeah. part of their suite. You know, and it's a shame because I, I really thought it was great. And then Arturia have got, that, got theirs, but of right. course they like, have to reprogram everything again. And they sounded really different. Um, so there was a lot of work matching those back up again. And then we changed platforms and I had to redo it again. Yeah. <laughs> So let's talk about because I've alluded to that. We're going to talk. So let's get into this now. So yeah, that's that's challenging. So as you said, I, I've um, had all that stuff. And back when some of those iconic songs were created, there were obviously no computers. Or uh, he did have some involvement though with the Fairlight and stuff as well, didn't he? Yeah, he did. And I've got some of those things in the set, but they're from the multi track. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. So I just sampled. Sometimes I'd have to, I'd just find, you know, the longest notes I could, loop them and do it that way. Yeah. There's only, there's been a couple of things like that. that I've, I've just, you know, fortunately, I've just had the keyboard stems from the originals and I've been able to grab a little bit of the sound that I need and make it work. Yeah, that's Sometimes with that, adding another soft synth to it as well, just to kind of like smooth it out flesh and disguise out a little bit or, or flesh it out a bit. Yeah. I'm really sorry you're asking about the difference with um, playing with John before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, because uh, um, well, John's like an absolute phenomenon. Like you know, like for me, he's he's the best front man in Australia. He's just absolutely incredible, yes. and that voice, like just a world class voice. Right. And he, he leaves it all on stage, you know. He never dials it in. He's like, he's just absolutely amazing. And he, I've done weekends with him. We've done five shows in three days. And he's like, just keeps going and going and going yeah. and never complains about getting tired or anything like that. And he's, in, he's indestructible. Mm. And the band is a really high energy band of, of, of like amazing musicians. I like feel very privileged to to play play with them, and it's a high energy show. So, um, it's the it, the difference with an ice house show. An ice house show is 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 a really big show. Like yes. I don't know how many other bands are doing that much stuff with like the big LED screens and no, that's right. Like loading up the semi. And, and going on tour, you know, like, um, yeah, so so it's a very different experience. But I think, like, probably for the Ice House thing, like, I often wish that I could be playing but also out there in the audience because yes. a lot of <laughs> stuff is happening behind me and a lot of it's about the lights and the, you know, and yeah. I've obviously, you know, you're watching an absolute icon, That's you know, right. and that, that yeah. voice is, like, just so you like, it's just him, you know. It's him. that's amazing, and and playing those to to get up and play Great Southern Land or yes. you know, Hey Little Girl or what you know, like that's got its whole own vibe about it. That's like playing the national anthem, you know, for me. Well, so that's right. Um, yeah. So so they're very different, like different energy. Um, like John is much more rock kind yes. of energy. Um, uh, obviously, you know, John is like, you know, there's, we're not playing, there's no tracks. We, no. we might have, it, but some of the in excess stuff I did, I did all the little shaker loops and things like that, that make in excess songs sound like in excess yes. songs. There's a lot of, lot of programs, shaker and tambourine sort of stuff in in excess. So I've done those and, and Johnny Salerno, the drummer, just triggers those from a pad. Yeah, good. Um, but that's just for the occasional thing, like, you know, and that's just, that's the only time we have to kind of lock into a diff, to a clock that's not us. Um, 
Yeah, so it's a very different thing. It's much more like a like a pub band yeah, experience. Organic, yeah. yeah, organic, you know. And um and again, like just iconic songs. Like you, know, you mentioned Don't Change, like that is so much fun to play. Yeah. It's not a it's not a demanding song to play, but it's just so much fun. No. And um Yeah, so that they are very different in that way, definitely. Yeah, no brilliant stuff. Um and just a comment you made um, on John's brilliant voice and, and also uh, Ivor being iconic is a uh, huge respect to Ivor in, in that he realises some of the songs now, uh, whether he's keeping them in the same key for, for particular reasons or whatever, that he will call on, say, Michael Painter or someone else to hit those ridiculously high notes that you can't expect any human being to hit once you get a little bit older than when he was recording them. Yeah, well, Ivor made the mistake of... Um Every record, he sang higher and higher. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and uh, he, that's what he told me that himself. He said, I shouldn't have done that. I've just yeah. made things really hard. So, yeah. So it's really weird because we do um, Electric Blue. We do that like down um, a minor third. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Like a pretty big jump down. And that means like, you know, I, so when, in any of those songs that we've had to drop keys on, and some of them we've had to drop quite a bit, that creates another issue around how do you make the same keyboard part That's work? Right. Really muddy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So just taking out bottom end, brightening things up, scooping out low mids, things like that, maybe um, drying up some effects because, you know, a, a delay down there doesn't work as well and no. things like that. Just trying to find a place for it to Fit. I'm always very conscious with sounds of like squeeze. You know, I don't like hearing stuff that's too bright and stuff that's like just taking up too much of the low, mid, and bottom end. Both those bands, uh, they kind of got that like um, mixed on NS10s type heritage. Yeah, yeah. So, so squeezing stuff makes sense, you know, um, just narrowing the frequencies a bit and. Yeah, that's important. Well, yeah, so dropping keys, dropping keys does make a chance. And uh, the other thing I do is like I always, I always play things in the original key, um, and transpose them in main stage because yeah. one day somebody's going to go, let's play Electric Blue, and they're doing it in the original key. Point. Well, <laughs> that's know? that's a great point, actually. Yeah. Um, and I, just on Electric Blue too, um, thoughts on the Killers cover? I thought it was reasonable. Don't think it was better. I'm a big fan of the Killers, Same, but yeah, yeah, but um, I was a bit underwhelmed by yeah. that. I, I don't think they put a lot of thought and time into it. I re- also didn't like the production of that recording yeah. at all. So, yeah, I'd, not their finest hour no, for me. Agreed. I, I love that band. Yeah, amazing band. Yeah, Glenn, if we could just you mentioned the Rock Academy earlier that, that your lad's gone to but uh also you've had some involvement with that for a while and i'd like to jump back to that if we can because i'm really interested in how that came about and you know you talked already about what it is and how it works but i'm interested in you know how, how would kids get involved in that and, and what's the um you know i guess what's the, the vision and mission of it and has that changed over time um yeah well uh I've done a lot of gigs over the years with Phil Sobrano, Kate's brother, who's an excellent musician and mm. um, and a very uh, uh, inspiring sort of person. He really likes sort of like helping people kind of get the best out of themselves. Um, and Alan Long is sort of the main guy at Rock Academy, not in, from a musical point of view, but as the guy that's kind of like put it together and organises it all. Um, so it's sort of p- pretty much a partnership with Alan Long and Phil Sobrano. And because I've done a lot of gigs with Phil, um, uh, he invited me to come in and, you know, be one of the mentors. So usually like you'll have maybe four, depending on how many kids there are there, sometimes five mentors mm-hmm. there. So, and we just, we spend the whole week just running from room to room you know, helping the kids mm. achieve their their vision, you know, what they want to do, you know. Um, and I've done a couple of songwriting workshops for them as well. Um, and I guess, like, the, the thing for Rock Academy is 
that with kids need a place to have that garage jam experience sort of thing. Um, yep. That's how that that's how Nirvana started. That's how do you know what I mean? Like that's right. That's how Silverchair started. You know, three mates in high school just like mate you know, started making noise in their garage, you know? Like bands that maybe they didn't play so good, but they loved them and all they wanted to do was play and they actually ended up getting really, really good because they had that time, you know, um, as in, in groups. So that's what Rock Academy provides for kids. It gives them that opportunity to get together and make some noise. That's right. Yeah. Mm. And so, and, and they get lots of sort of guidance along the way, although, like, you know, we are, we, we, we do stay pretty hands. We're, we're not running the show. The kids run the show. Um, we're just there to sort of put out fires if necessary, and uh, if they get stuck, we unstick them, you know. Yeah. Um, but they're, they're largely autonomous, and... Um, it's a long day. They do it. They do like four days of like from ten till four. Okay. And you'll take your lunch break, and you'll be walking past rooms, and they've and they and fifteen minutes later, half the kids are back, and they've gone back into their rooms, and they're jamming again. You know, they just can't get enough of yeah. it. That's awesome. Yeah. So, um, and you've I've seen amazing things like, okay, it was one one that I did, and there was a first time there. Uh, a young woman who um, extremely introverted, just so shy and wouldn't make con- eye contact with anybody, um, didn't want to get involved in any of the kind of team collaborative songwriting workshoppy stuff. Um, if you asked, if you tried to sort of like ask her a question and get her involved, so she'd like literally like look like this, she wanted to be swallowed by the floor and, um, and that, and she is, she's, done, I don't know how many rock academies she's done now, but probably at least four and she fronts her own band Yeah, wow. and, you know, um, it's great. Yeah. So, uh, and it's just to see what, and, and it was really, for, and I could be wrong, this is, but for me, it was just like, she was with her people, you know, mm. she's like, I found it, I found somewhere, you know? And I found my thing and it's music and it's playing music with other people and it's writing songs and it's, you know, not and turning off the critical voice in your head and just mm. having a go and, you know, all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, I've, I've seen it be, I think it's quite transformative for a lot yes. of the kids. So it just runs during school holidays and, and it's like four days of pretty intense um uh, workshopping, collaborating. Um, they, the kids amaze me how um, they're able to sort of, you know, democratically, you know, get an original song written. Yeah. And, yep. You know, there's no, like there's very rarely, you know, disagreements or, you know, anything on the level that would require any intervention from us, mm. you know. And it just sounds like, it just sounds like a, a fun rock and roll camp sort of thing. It, you know, and, and, and they, yeah. so they also learn a cover. And one of the amazing things is they will take on the most ambitious covers, you know, like yeah. a band with like, you know, a drummer that's only been playing for like a year or something. And, you know, to be charitable, I'd say like could barely even be called a drummer. And I'll go, let's do cashmere, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And I'll go, are you sure? You know, that's pretty, yeah, yeah. that's a pretty heavy song. Like, that's, it's going to take a lot of work. Okay, yeah, I know, we just really like it. Okay. <laughs> I go, okay. Right. And maybe, like, you know, at the end of the first day of them, like, pressing that, I'm like, I don't say anything, but, like, but you know, I want to say, are you sure you don't want to reassess and pick something else? Because I can't see this coming together. And lo and behold, by the time they get to their gig night, they're, they're playing cash, man. It. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, so, like, it's incredible, right? Just oh, yeah. their capacity for, like, taking on a challenge and not getting discouraged and yeah. having patience with each other. 
because you might have in the same band you might have a kid who's been playing guitar for like eight years and is like chops you know you could hire him to play in a professional band no problem and there might be another kid that like can barely play a basic backbeat on the drums mm. and it still works and no one cracks it and you know yeah no, it's huge. yeah it shows huge resilience on part of the kids and just great concept overall and i mean it probably links to with a question we commonly ask glenn which is around key lessons you'd like to pass on to other players and it sounds like even though you're quite hands off that you do get that opportunity what what are some of the key lessons you you'd let a, an up and coming keyboard player know about uh i think like un- just understanding your role you know for me that's been sort of easy because you know, I'm a, I'm a parts player and the parts have probably already been, you know, created by somebody much, you know, much more experienced and, you know, with a lot more runs on the board than me. And um, so just understanding your role, um, I think a lot of stuff about playing in bands is just like, a lot of it still is kind of like the social thing too. Like yeah. just understand how to actually be with a bunch of people and, 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 you know, and make, and it's a pleasant experience for everybody. Um, I think that took me a little while to learn too. <laughs> um, so yeah. And then the same, it's the same, not just for keys, but you know, for saxophone, like, I mean, my God, like there's, there's, literally hundreds of better saxophone players in Australia than me, but I don't know how many there are that would give you the right eight bars mm, at exactly. the right time. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. In 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 the context of a rock or pop, you know, electro That's right. whatever you want to call drivers thing. Um, you know, just like the just getting it. Just um, just getting it, you know? Understanding what it is that you need to do and yeah so um yeah i think that's i think it's just everything's about context i reckon yeah agreed um and i'm really i'm really anal on parts i'm just uh, parts and sounds you know i'm kind of a bit ocd about it and it really like when i hear somebody else playing and i know the song and they're not actually playing they're sort of playing the part that irritates me because yes. <laughs> I don't know that, that part is perfect. It works. It, it works when you play the part, when you're not playing the part, it starts getting a bit, get starts getting a bit loosey goosey for me. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, good lessons. Absolutely. Good lessons. Well, I don't know. Like it's not like it's not particularly creative or anything, but that's what my, that's what my role has been in the yeah, bouncer. Yeah. No just crime. be the guy that just nails the sound and nails the part. You know. Good stuff. And I think that makes any any musician very very uh, employable, but uh, more so keyboard players. I think because it's it's you know I always say half the role is is being accurate, the other half, or in terms of what you play, the other half is being bang on with the sounds too. Yeah, I think the sounds are so important in 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 keyboards. Like mm. in a way, like. Oh, you had um, Dave Matthews on oh, Jamiroquai's guy, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, Matt Johnson, Jamiroquai, Dave Matt, Matthews oh, sorry, from yes. um, Santana, yeah. 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 Um, so the Jamir- JK's, uh, Jamiroquai's keyboard player is... Matt Johnson, yeah. Matt Johnson, yeah. So, I, I, like, that was... In a way, like, Matt's job is harder and easier than mine because um, he doesn't have to replicate the sounds. He's, he's making them. Mm, right true but he has to come up with the with the great sounds right but he doesn't have to go through and try to dig that out from the background of a a recorded version of the song and try work out what the hell's going on you know he knows he knows what it is you know um so yeah so for a lot of us you know i mean the well i i play in you know with John Stevens and with ISS and stuff, but like, and I'm not the only person that sort of makes this distinction. I've heard other guys say it too. It's like, you know, 
you're still in a cover band from your point of view, you know. You've got Ivo and you've got, like, these original songs. You've mm. got, like, you know, but, you know, even even the original Ice House was in a cover band because Ivo came up with all the parts. Yeah, yeah, that's you know? right. Yeah, so your mm. job is still to replicate, right? So, which is the essence of, you know, what, you know, you, what playing covers is, is that, you know. So, yeah, yeah. Oh, I, th- I think you're playing on, Glenn. Because I mean, even even an original band, you're you're playing when you're playing live, you'd be still replicating what the the fans know from hearing on a recording. It still yep. so it still has to sound the same. So yeah. Yep. Yep. I think so. And look, we did an amazing um, project called Dub House, which um, I don't, a lot of people didn't hear of. But um, <laughs> um, so we did because I've always wanted to be a chucker man. You know, just doing that chucker, <laughs> chucker, right? Um, and so we did Dub House, which was a project of doing um, the Ice House repertoire in reggae and dub. That's funny. And um, we did it. Uh, uh, we played uh, at the, uh, I can't remember the name of the place in Sydney, great live venue in Sydney. And the ESPY, we did it at the ESPY. Oh, yeah. And we made, we made a record and um, and everything. And that was really cool because i've got we got to i didn't have to replicate anymore it was um so we were inventing you know were ways you playing, were you playing organ bubbles and stuff like that yeah i saw i we had um simon burke uh playing most of the organ stuff like the that's yep. that thing um he's really good at that and we had uh, but i had i was doing mostly brass section stuff and some pads and other kind of dubby sound effects sort of things um yeah and that was but that was really fun like just coming up with you know what like reinventing these songs and you know not playing songs that we played a million times but not having to replicate them anymore that was that was a little bit of a holiday (laughs) yeah it would have been fun would have been fun and um Speaking of playing live and playing different things live, we have a standard question that we, we ask all our guests, which makes us all feel better as, as live performers, which is can you share a particularly interesting train wreck story that may have occurred to you? Yeah, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> God, I can tell you one. That I, I've got a, it was a really close call where we were doing a live TV thing. Um with an audience and everything. I think from memory it was at, might have been at Rod Laver's. Anyway, um, and it's come up to us and, of course, like there's been other bands on, so my gear's been sort of broken and down, put backstage and then brought up and it's just like a 10-minute changeover. And I cannot get the keyboard to talk to my Mac. Uh-huh. And I'm just like... Trying everything, blah blah blah, and and then Eddie comes out with John, and they're there at that, and he's like, and the first song is Touch, which is pads <laughs> and piano, yeah, and it's literally yeah. getting down to the last five seconds, and oh, there it is, finally, got it. Oh, so and take it away, and that was like the right that five seconds right there was the first was when I actually managed to get the two things talking to each other again. But the worst, right. another live televised thing, and it was one of those um, bushfire relief oh, yeah. thing, and um, live televised. And I was using my, I was using my XP50 just as a, oh, yeah. a MIDI controller. But the reason that I was using it was because I thought if anything goes wrong with the Mac, I've got some basic sounds set up on it that I could go to the XP50 and play the set if I needed to. Mm. Um, and it just started sending bursts of, like, dense, random nonsense MIDI to the Mac. <laughs> and it would actually sound – and it would sound almost like there was a bad mic line or something like that. It was like a real just a <sighs> sort of yeah. thing. But loud and – for a while, it took ages to work out what was, and then eventually, and this is all, you know, we're doing like 10 songs or something, 
and a massive crowd and live TV and I'm a I've got I've got to get off the Mac and just play straight from the XP and it took ages to get a tech to just unplug two lines and plug them <laughs> into other DIs and stuff. So there's footage of me going like, you know, frantically gesturing, you know, these two lines here, out of here, into here, into the DIs. And, and we've got Don't Change coming up and it's still, and so we plug into the XP and it's still happening. Oh, because, wow, nice. because I, I guess keyboards these days, like there's no such thing as truly internal. It still all goes through the same MIDI controller part yeah. of the keyboard and sends it to the internal sounds, like as an internal sound module instead of yeah, absolutely, you know I mean? absolutely. So there was obviously something had gone wrong with the that part of the motherboard, you know, and. Anyway, all I could do was just play and just, like, hope that it didn't happen in really prominent places, which it still occasionally did. But, like, you know, just dying yeah. on stage and no way out of it. No, no backup people there. Um, we had one. We we're, were playing on Bribey Island. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, yeah. With a, and and um, that was one of those sort of by-the-sea things or okay. Red Hot Summer. Yeah. And... Um, because we had to take everything over on the little boat, um, our stage guy decided not to bring my keyboard and we just use the backline higher one there. <laughs> so we start playing. There's no sound check or anything. Start playing and everything's like a tone down. Oh, nice. And I'm like, what the hell? And I'm looking at this thing and I'm like, Yo, is there a transpose yeah. button on et cetera, et cetera. And it's take, take, took like one and a half songs to actually work out what had actually happened. It had a broken pitch wheel. Uh. So so I gave the pitch wheel oh, a tweak and it, it magically comes back into concert and then over the next four bars gradually drifts down oh, to no. <laughs> <laughs> So it's not as if you uh, tone, you're just sort of between tones. It was horrible. And it, and I can't <laughs> I can't just start playing everything up a tone because the splits don't work That's right. that way. Yeah, or you split right. them so, up. Yep. Yeah. So and then it took another three songs to get a second keyboard up on stage. Oh, you know, God. So one of the other bands, you know, had to go back and you know find their keyboard that was already loaded into something and you know all that sort of thing. So yeah. So there's been a, there's been a few. Good. Uh, look, yeah. That's a bad. Yeah, surprise. I think that's that's. That's our plight, really, isn't it? Like, I suppose for a guitarist, it's like, you know, blowing a valve on an amp or... Yeah, that's right. Breaking um, breaking three strings or... Exactly. Yeah, no, good stories. All right, we're on the, the final um, double question. So these are the, the ones I, I we, we try and give our guests kind warning on, and that is, um, first one, Glenn, is tag a keyboard player. So keyboard player you admire that you would actually love to find out more about their history as a player? Uh, and sorry, to a, be, and just for transparency, sorry, Glenn didn't get warning of this one, whereas he yeah, should have, yeah. to be fair. Um, Bruce Hornsby. Oh, good call. Yeah. Okay, yeah. He is on the bucket list, and I think I made one approach, but... Uh, we had the pleasure of a guest on that uh, knew Bruce growing up, and I'm having a mental blank who that was at the moment, Paul. Uh, oh, but... that would have been Dave, um, Dave Matthews. Could have been too. Yeah, anyway, yeah. Or it might have been, actually, no, it might have been uh, Jeff Babco. It was, no, it was Jeff Babco. Yeah, yeah, that's Jeff who it was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, great call. That's all, that's, you've answered it. You've answered it, Glenn. <laughs> Bruce Hornsby, couldn't agree more. Oh, it's just because um, it's not just his piano playing. Like, there's a lot of just beautiful pads and bills and oh, things yeah. like that. Yeah. And and I think from a production point of view and stuff too, like, and just from a, yeah, a songwriting point of view, obviously. Yeah, I'd say, I'd, I, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Great but, call. And then the one we did give you warning on um, was Desert Island Disc, so five albums you couldn't live without. Yeah, so... Oh, I'll start. I'll we'll stick with Bruce. I guess just say the way it is. Yeah. Just because, you know. Um, look, Thomas Dolby, Aliens Ate My Buick. Yeah, nice. 
Uh, so like just a brilliant headphone album. This one's got no keys on it, but um, uh, look, I love um, all the Keith Jarrett, you know, Pat yeah. Metheny group yeah. sort of stuff. It's really cool. And um, but there's a Keith Jarrett album called Luminescence, which is a, a piece that he wrote for uh, st- uh, string orchestra and um, saxophone. And oh, uh, uh, that is just absolutely amazing. Mm. Uh, the first Seal album, I reckon, is oh, a yep. great album. Yeah. Um, I I kind of I, – I really get a, a bit more sometimes out of watching um, live DVDs. Agreed, yeah. So um, Alison Krauss and Union Station Live is just – that's a absolute lesson in pristine musicianship, like incredible. Great. Um, and – the Sade Lovers Rock one, which oh. is just, yeah. Um, again, great sounds and great sort of programming and production and stuff, but um, an amazing production design for that show too. Like just a, it's just a feast for the eyes as well. I'll be checking that out. And then one more, if I can do one more as far as like live DVD things yeah, goes, yeah. there's a Catano Veloso one, which is, uh, again, just I can't remember the title of the DVD, but uh, Scatano Veloso Live, and it's just the most beautifully shot, um, you know, obviously all that beautiful uh, uh, Brazilian sort of thing. Yeah. And it's just just beautifully shot and um, kind of one of those things where somebody's singing in a another language, that, <laughs> you know, singing in Portuguese, mm. but... Um, but could still make you weep, you That's know, right. without yeah. knowing what he's talking about. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, Great I went, mix. I went, I went and saw um, uh, um, Sigur Ross. Oh yeah, oh they're amazing. I uh, got arena. Yeah, that. I don't know who comes up with all the keyboard stuff for that, but like that would be another great person to talk to, yeah. like. Actually, yeah, it's a great, yeah, great call. Masters of atmosphere, yeah, you know? otherworldly those Another guys. Another one, like you know, singing in Icelandic or whatever, yeah. and uh, and people just with tears running down their faces, and you yes. go like, the guy could be a shopping list for all you know. Like. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> no, good, yeah, great call. No, and great, great picks overall, Glenn. Um, I can't thank you enough for taking the time with us. It's been a, an absolute pleasure and um, it sounds like everything going well, you're in for a busy year and um, may there be many, mm. many more busy years to come. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure being on. Thanks for letting me ramble on in my own haphazard and scattered way. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, look forward to, like, come see us at a Sydney show. Come, come say hello. Right, and um, look, I do apologise to our outside of Australia listeners. Um, I, I had a hell of a ball talking to Glenn and we, we got a bit Aussie, Aussie-fied there in parts, but um, I think pretty much our international listeners will have picked up on that and, and understood it. It was an absolute pleasure talking to another great player. It certainly was, and I thought you did a great job translating Australian to English where you had to, <laughs> David, as well. So uh, I'm sure our overseas listeners will be fine with it. But, yeah, it was great. I think, you know, those of us here in Australia know what an amazing and iconic band Ice House and what an amazing and iconic performer John Stevens is. Mm-hmm. And and I think a lot of our overseas listeners may have even perhaps been introduced to some of the work of Ice House uh, via the Killers cover that you mentioned in the interview yes. as well. Yeah, I, I think, um, and and John Stevens obviously known as that interim singer uh, after the unfortunate death of Michael Hutchins. So yeah, certainly, and Indeed. LRB. I mean, there's there's not many people, um, particularly in the US, that haven't heard of Little River Band. So, so um, true. Yeah, no, ama- amazing interview and a huge thanks to Glenn. Um, that was yeah, really, really insightful. And wasn't yeah. he wasn't he generous with his thoughts and passionate? Yes, and I, I certainly don't want to be trying to drive from Geelong to um, Cairns in forty eight hours. <laughs> That's no, just thank incredible. You. Um, no, thank you. 
So yes, uh, that that's the episode with Glenn. Um, we'll we'll be back in again in two to three weeks. But just a reminder that you can keep in touch via a few means. The website is www.keyboardchronicles.com, uh, Facebook at facebook.com forward slash keyboard chronicles. And unlike certain presidents of the United States, our accounts haven't been banned. So we are still on Twitter at the keyboard chr one, um, and we do have email at editor at keyboardchronicles.com. Um, Paul, thanks again. Couldn't do this without you. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure to be involved. Thank you so much again. Uh, and thanks to you, our brilliant listeners, and we'll see you back here next episode. <laughs>